to get to these steps each week we do a review and we begin at step one which we said is the foundation of recovery and uh, I always you know think how blessed we are to have the opportunity of the first step uh, not to just to have it happen to us because no no one no, none of us set out to become powerless over alcohol but to, to have the opportunity to know that we're alcoholics and as we compare ourselves to the many people who will never realize the alcoholics. As we say that we, we, once we, uh, we have a problem, we don't really understand the exact nature of it. For a period of time, we go through this. And we we're fortunate that we come to Alcoholics Anonymous, and it's in Alcoholics Anonymous that we can find what is the problem. And we find out, as we looked at the first part of the book, our problem was twofold. We had a physical allergy coupled with a mental obsession. And these two things make us powerless over alcohol. This is the first step of recovery. You know, I, uh, uh, as we look at this, Dr. Silkworth talks about the physical allergy, and he says this, we have an abnormal reaction to alcohol, that once the alcohol takes, his, takes a drink of alcohol, alcohol any, any alcohol whatsoever into his system, something occurs, you know, that it doesn't occur in the average tempered drinker. And once, once an alcohol takes a drink, he experiences a a phenomenon of craving, a craving that is beyond the control of the mind. And that's a, a very, you know, that's really a point that I don't think we look at sometimes, you know. Many, many times we say, I'm going to take, take a drink, but I'm going to control it with my mind. You know, I'm going to just take two and stop. You know, there's two things you're going to do if you've got a drink. You've got to start and you've got to stop. <laughs> you know, it, starting is easy. See, and both of these things have to be done with the mind. See? You start with the mind, and you have to stop with the mind. But in the, in the case of an alcoholic, something happens in between those two drinks. <laughs> you know, in between those two drinks, we develop a phenomenal craving. And it's a physical thing, and it's beyond the control of the mind. So if we, in this case, if we, we, because of the physical allergy, every time we drink, we trigger a phenomenal craving, so we can't drink safely. And because of the mental obsession, then we can't really say quit drinking. We can quit, but this, this obsession will make us start over again. So these two things makes us powerless over alcohol. Then it comes to the second step. If the, if the problem is powerless, the solution is power. And it's the second step is come to believe that a power greater than ourselves can restore us to sanity, can remove the obsession. <clears throat> and then we believe this is the solution to the problem. And all we have to do is to believe and, and we're on our way. We don't have to have faith in this thing. And it's easy for us to believe in this power because we can see it working in the lives of other people. We hear many other people say, this happened to me. And if we have come to these two conclusions, she said she was, was ready tonight. You know, if we have run over the first part of the book, uh, if we saw the, the description of the alcoholic, the chapter agnostic, our adventures before and after, these things, this first section of the book should have showed us these two steps. Our book shows us the problem and the solution. And if, we, and if that's the case, it's we are now at step three. And step three is the beginning of the real recovery program. Step three through 12 is a planned program of action, a practical program of action, rather, that leads to this power that overcomes the powerlessness. The first thing we do in this, in this practical program of action is to make a decision. And then once we made this decision to go this way, there were some actions that we had to take. And we began to go through this series of actions. Uh, the first was an inventory to find out the things that blocked us off from God. You know, if we made this decision, there are some things we're going to have to do to carry out this decision. And uh, in the inventory process, we inventoried our grosser handicaps. Uh, we inventoried our, our, uh, our resentments. We alcoholics are 
is the number one offender that blocks us off from God. You know, God really just can't work with a person real good that's off in a resentment. In fact, nobody else can. He, can, <laughs> he can't do too much for himself. Because when we have a resentment, we're paralyzed by that. It's, it's a paralyzing force. It cuts us off from the sunlight of the Spirit. It cuts us off from really doing anything functional in our lives. You know, but we alcoholics seem to get off into that habit. And we, we list and analyze and we see what the damaging factor of this and how much we have done it. We also put down where, what the things we resent and why we resent them and which part of self was involved. And then we do the same thing with our fears and we do the same thing with the, our sex conduct of the past and then we're on our way. We have, we have identified these things and now the next process is to go to work on them. So in step five we begin to relate these to, to God, ourselves and other human beings. And we got a little more down to the exact nature of them. In step six, we, uh, we, got, we asked God to remove them once we've seen the damaging factor of them. And we became willing to have them removed. In seven, we asked him to remove them. So really, as we begin, uh, as we begin to work on ourselves uh, based on these conclusions that we were powerless and that there was a power you know, we, we made this decision to put in step three, based on one and two, to put God in the center of our lives. And this is the correct, uh, you know, whether we, uh, whether we like it or not, we haven't lived that way, but the real fact, the principle of life, that, uh, you know, God is within every human being. Uh, it's our conception of God, but there is some sense of direction within each of us. We all have a conscience, we all have a, whatever we want to call it, the soul, we all have some form of guidance, uh, that inner voice that speaks to us. And you know, and we can, we, can, we can do as we choose, or we can decide to live with that, or we can combat it as we have been. But it's, well, based on these two alternatives, though, we made a decision that, that to listen to, we made a decision to, to use that direction which was in us. And so, for the first time, we become uh, 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 our spiritual life is in the right way it should be. And then in four, five, six, and seven, we worked on ourselves, our minds. I am a product of what I think. You know, I am a product of the stock in trade. Whatever we are today is the results of the, it wasn't what this accidentally what happened to the outside of our lives, it's what happens within our minds. I am a product of what I, of the thoughts that I have each day. So in four, five, six, and seven, based on this decision, we were working on recreating a new life because, you know, the doctor said we'd become restless, nervous, and discontent. And if we remain the same person, uh, you know, we become a whole lot of other things. We alcoholics, we become lonely, we become upset, and uh, you just go on and on. What I had a bunch of things happen to me, you know. But when these things uh, got to me, then I I was powerless, so. I, I made a decision to drink. You know, and alcohol relieved this. So it's all about putting this life back together again. And we said a personality change sufficient to recover. And this is already happening. You know, uh, once he says, you know, we begin to develop some tolerance and patience and goodwill toward all men. And throughout these steps, we see some personality changes take place. Step five is the beginning of the spiritual experience. And we, we have some gradual change throughout here already. But then once we complete that area, then we come tonight into the final area that we have to work on. Uh, and this is uh, our relationship with others. Um, this is ourselves. And of course, this is God. God, ourselves, and others. And that's what that's what human life is all about, you know. Life does have a design. And each, each, and, every, each and every life is, is one's relationship with God. It's one's mind. And it's one's relationship with, uh, with the world, the people in it. Now, there are three dimensions of human life. And I, you know, I never could get my life in order. And I had a lot of, in fact, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know much about it. Uh, but what I worked on what was obvious. This outer circle, we all, we don't know why we talk about steps eight and nine because we, we alcoholics are expert in that area. 
Because that's the only area we live in. You know what I mean? That's the only area we live in. We haven't ever looked in, we haven't looked and never thought about our spiritual life. You know, we never grew up at all. And this is why we had to come as a child. That's what the, the big, big book says, come as a child, because we are children there. We have never did any growing there. You know? Now, if you don't grow up in here, you know, you, you haven't built your house on a firm foundation. And you're going to have problems in your mind. You have problems relating to people. You know, that was my earlier idea. I had problems mixing and talking to people. I was shy and I was afraid of people. And I, and they, I was always comparing, like Clancy, I mean, Clancy said, I compared the, my, uh, my insides with their outsides, you know. And, and, and so quite naturally, I was, uh, didn't have, so I went and put alcohol in there. And alcohol become a power greater than myself. And I found out when I put alcohol on here, I feel good. I felt good here, and I could talk to people good. God, you know. And finally, you know, alcohol didn't work. It finally started coming in here, getting in my mind. And then it started getting out here, getting in my outside circle. In fact, in fact, it took over the whole thing. And then I tried to start putting the circle back, back together again. And, and it was like Humpty Dumpty on the wall. You know, he had a great fall, and I couldn't try to get Humpty Dumpty back together again. And I had a lot of problems. And this outside circle is made up of, uh, when we say physical, 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 and our sociological circle, it's made up of everything. It's, you know, it's made up of the job, the wife, the car, the money, bank account, you know, the clothes, the automobile. All these things are in our physiological world. I mean, it's our physical, it's our phys not only our physical bodies, but the, the, the other people and the world in which we live. And uh, for many, many years, I tried to, uh, after the, the thing got in a mess, I tried to straighten up that circle. And of course, a lot of great, uh, uh, some people said, you need to straighten this up first. You know, but Alcoholics Anonymous, we say this is an inside job. We're going to work from the inside out. Because it don't do much good to straighten this circle up unless you, and should build it on something firm. So tonight we're talking about really going to do this for the first time. And when, when I had problems, the first time I tried to do this before I come to the program, before I did these other things, I always tried to trade this circle up. You know, I, I, would get my, I would get my job back and the wife would be gone. I'd have the car, but the wife would be gone. And I'd get the wife back and the job would be gone. And I'd have the car, next thing I'd get the wife and the job and the car would be gone. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I never could get, and then, and then people, some idiots say, you ain't trying. <laughs> yeah. Hell, I tried like hell. It's a job, you know, I just all those things. But then, you know, in this program, once we get to work from the inside out, and that's what the program's all about, you know, <clears throat> once we get our spiritual life together, we can develop our mind, we can build, build our minds together. We can get rid of some of those old things, those old forces that's dominating our lives. And the slowly we'll build this. Now tonight we're going back to do this outside circle. And step eight says we, we've made a list of the, of the people we have harmed. And it says we should have did this when we took step four. And we did, I think. You know, I had a lot of the people on my list. And as, a, uh, as we go through our resentments, and we do our resentments the way the big book outlines it. You know, we actually, we actually will see a lot of the same people on our resentment list uh, that will be on the people that we owe the men's call. We set the ball to roll. You know, I, I have one that I always like to share that, that it, it, we think it's legal to resent your mother-in-law. You know, I had one of those, you know. We played that joke, but this was a fine lady. And I, and I, I could just... I remember the years of sickness, I could just turn this over in my mind and how it used to make me mad. And as I inventoried that, and as I went across, uh, I went across uh, what she done, I put a name down, and I put the cause down, and then I traced the cause to what part of self does she affect? Well, it was very obvious. She, she had interfered with my, my personal relationships. You know what I mean? Uh, she had interfered with my self-esteem. You know what I mean? She had interfered with my prestige, everything. She had interfered with 
or, or my security, my financial security, and my emotional security. She interfered with my sex life. Every part of self this woman has struck. And for many years now, I had resented the hell out of her. And I mean, I just loved to set up and play that over. You know what I mean? And say, I'm going to do this. And you know how we do it, plan, you know, never do it. Just plan what we're going to do. Never works out that way. And think about the many hours I squandered in my life. And I could always see, by playing it over, I was always able to resent her. And all those many years, I had completely excused myself. Completely never excused myself. In fact, I think the main reason of playing the resentment was to cover up for myself. But when we put that down in inventory and analyzed it, my book said, did not you set the ball to roll it? And I, I can honestly look at it now, and it was my actions. It was my selfishness, my inconsideration, you know what I mean? My dishonesty toward my, my, her daughter and my family that made that woman retaliate against me. So instead, you know, once we analyze that, that's not a resentment anymore. You know? Once we analyze that, he said we should have made that list when we took step four. That my mother-in-law was quite obviously not a person that I should resent. It was a person that I owed unto me. See? So we should have made that list of a lot of the people that I had, a lot of my fears. You know, like I said, I fear the internal revenue. <laughs> the hell, I owed them a man. <laughs> I stole from them. <laughs> if I had stole from them, I never would have had to fear. So once we list and analyze these things, we've got a list made. And they said, we make a list of, of the people we have harmed. And if we don't uh, do this, if this step, if we don't do this step, you know, our book says, remember, we're willing to, we promise that we're going to any length. And if we don't, you know, this is a total program. There's no way you can do two-thirds of the steps. It's a, it's a total process. You know, there's no way you can say, like people say, well, I got drunk, what happened? Which step did I miss? I said, well, you must have missed all 12 of them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you can't take one out that you missed. You missed the whole thing, you know. <laughs> Uh, so it was, the rest of the work, the two, the, all the work, I don't care how, how much work we did and how good, all of it would be wasted if we didn't do eight and nine. See, because if we didn't clean up the wreckage of the past, if we don't go out and clear up these things in step eight and nine, then they're going to back up into the mind. We're going to have, we're going to have guilt and remorse and shame. We're going to be looking over our shoulder. We're going to have fears. These things are going to creep back into mind. They're going to cut us off in the sunlight and the spirit, and we're going to drink again. So, you know, you've got to do all of the program. So now, we go out, and he says, we, we, we got this list. We made it when we took step four. And we can look around our lives, and we can see if anyone else that we harm for any other reason. We can add this. We can get those names off of, our, off of the uh, inventory sheet, the people that we set the ball rolling. We can see those. And if we have any other people that were out of harm in any other way, we can add them on the list. And the key thing is the first step, and is a lot of people have problems with this step, and I think the biggest problem with step eight is step nine. And there are two steps. You know, there are two steps, and this is why they have step eight and nine. First of all, if you do eight, eight always comes before nine, so let's do eight first. If we do eight first, then look like nine's real easy. And eight, and eight is a two-part step, too, and and if we can just, uh, a lot of people just can't say, well, I'm not going to make amends to anybody. Well, it doesn't say that. The step says make a list of the people. And this is easy enough to do is make a list of the people we have harmed. You know, you don't really have to talk to anybody to make that list. Anybody can sit down and make a list of all the people he has harmed in his life that he, that he can think of. Quite a few guys come to me and say, well, I can't think of them. I say, well, if you can't think of them, you don't need to write them down because they surely ain't bothering you. If you can't think of 
But once we get that list, then it says become willing to make amends to those people. How do we get become willing? Now there are certain people on our list that we can divide this list in. Let's divide this list into four areas. Okay. And there are certain people on there that are real close to us, maybe like a mother, usually, or maybe our children, or maybe our grandmother, those type of people. Not our wife, maybe. She won't go on here. <laughs> or our husband. But probably the grandmother, you know. You know, we, everybody would like to make amends to grandma. <laughs> you know, that's easy. Or the little kids. I mean, or maybe to our mother, who we don't do any wrong by her anyway. I don't care what we do. Oh, he's just a nice boy. That's his friends. That's what mama never sees anything wrong. <laughs> That's what Al Capone's mother said, you know. <laughs> now, so it's easy to go to those people, and there's no problem in making amends to them. And what's wrong with so let's let, we would we go to them right now. So let's put now up here. And let's put all those people on this list that we're ready to go to right now. The easy ones, right? There's nothing wrong with working up to these things. And there are some other people, and we remember we got the list made out, and there's some other people that uh, we don't want to make them right now. I know I'm going to make it, but... Uh, I don't know, it may be right now, but maybe later. So we'll put it up here later, right? And we'll put those on the later list. And then we got some other people here. We know we're going to make them, but I may and I may not. So let's put them in the maybe, right? Maybe. And we got a few maybes, a few laters. And then those SOBs <laughs> that we ain't going to never make them into. Let's put them two or three on the never list. Now if you do it this way, it will enable you a way to get started. Now we alcoholics are very negative people. We think negatively. <laughs> We think negatively, you know. And we're motivated by negative things. You know I mean? Therefore, what we have done, we have let these three people stop us from doing the rest of this list. You know I mean? Now, you see, by putting those over here, we can start over here. You know? And then chances are, if we start over here, and see the real benefit and relief of doing these. The time we get through with these, the chances are we want to try to work on the latest a little bit. You know I mean? And after the latest, you'd be surprised. We're going to be working on the maybes. And one of these days is going to be so much fun, we're going to have to go get some of them nevers and work on them. <laughs> but at least it will give us a way to get started. And that's the greatest, that's the only thing an alcoholic needs is a start. And once we, we, we will never get the benefit out of the step until you take it, until you start working on it. You know, it says some, most alcoholics owe money. Uh, I was glad to see that. I thought I was unique, you know. <laughs> and, and we do, you know. And if you owe somebody money, uh, make, uh, making amends means to set right or wrong. You know, uh, you go up and tell the person, you know, I'm sorry. Well, he wants to know where my money Sorry is all right, but they ain't really making them in. And our book tells us we got ways to do this. You know, there's no, nothing that's impossible. You know, you can go to this person, you can set up, you make, the book says you can strike another deal. You know, you can tell him, you know, you might, why you've been slow, and uh, you know you owe this obligation. And, and of course, we alcoholics, we would like to, we're in our grandiose ways. We want to really hide from the guy 
walk around with shame and guilt and get drunk again until we get it all and go in there where we can throw it all down and walk out. Here's your damn money. You know. <laughs> That's the way we like to do it, you know. See, but that, that is not what the program is all about. It's all about putting our, our lives, putting ourselves in the right perspective. Maybe we have to humble ourselves, and this, this is the way it should be. Maybe we have to go to this person and say, well, I, I can't, uh, I, I don't have it, but I can pay you a little bit at a time until I get this done. And I think some of us, you know, a lot of times uh, what we owe seems like a, a, a pretty good sum. It does. In some cases, I know it, it runs a pretty good sum. But still, in regards to what we can do, we can always, we can start on that in some small way and deal with it. You know, I, I, one of the greatest things I heard in the, pro in the last couple of years was a friend of mine, in, uh, with Charlie and I was in Tulsa. And this guy owed, uh, this guy paid off his amends uh, here a couple of years ago. And he had been sober 29 years when he finished paying the lifestyle. And he, but he made a deal, and he's paid on it for 29 years, a little at a time until he got it paid off. So it can be done. Yeah. And, but I think, you know, in those 29 years, it wasn't paid, but he sure had a great relief. I mean, he wasn't looking back in the over his shoulder. He didn't have that guilt and remorse, because when you want, once pay that first payment, you know, that frees you of that. So we can, we can take care of these things, and if we, we, we use the, the big book and in the context of the book, and it says, you know, it talks about that some of us have committed criminal offenses, and it tells us how to do with that. If we go through the book, each, the book gives us great detail on, um, on how to deal with different types of amen. And there's prayer within, in this, in this step. You know, uh, uh, willingness is a, is a key. Step eight is, uh, when we make the list, <clears throat> then this process is, enables us to become willing. And this is the freedom. The freedom is so not so much in making amends, but the, the freedom in, the, in this process to become willing. Once we make this list and become willing to make amends, then we're really free in our minds, and that's the, that's the process of the step. Step nine says after we become willing, then we make the amends for however possible. Now, you know, if we're willing, we're, 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 we're ready to do this. We're free. Now, wherever possible, we make the amend. Now, I didn't say that we go out and try to do all of them at once, because this is, you know, this, this is a realistic program. Uh, wherever possible, we make these amends as we see these people or whenever the thing is right. And I think that this is God working within our lives, because only God can set that set, set up and guide our life. Only God knows what's going on within me and what's going on within the individual. I don't go out on my own and do this. Wherever possible, I make each amen. Now, he does tell me when not to make them. Yeah? He doesn't tell me when to. He tells me where to and when not. When to make these amends would injure other people, I can't do this. But I'm free because I'm willing. I'm free anyway. So there are two rules that we have to apply to making these myths, wherever possible, and when other people are injured, we can't do it. So, but the key thing, we can go, we can go on and on and on because we're living with these things. And I think that we alcoholics, I know I have some things that, some burdens in this area. There are some things that wherever possible have not come about. There are some amends that I, I, I still care that would injure other people if I were to make them. But they don't bother me. I'm free. No, no shame or no guilt over them because I'm willing to do it. You know, we alcoholics, uh, we'd like to have a clean slate. We'd like to have all of them off so we could have a clean slate. But I think uh, the way I work, I'd probably have some more on the list. You know? <laughs> so I think, you know, the, the pain or maybe of carrying these things, it helps me remember. And I think one of the most important things in, on the face of the earth tonight is people. You know, one time in my life, I said, if, you know, I didn't feel like that. I used to feel, man, if they get rid of these damn people, I'd be all right. People wasn't my problem. But I think once somewhere in our lives, we, we, we live with people, living with each other. And this is a fantastic part of living and getting along with people. Um, with all their problems, with our problems, too, as, as individuals. 
but the great thrill that we can live on the face of this earth with people. And, and, and the more people we have in our lives, the, more, the better our lives are, the more successful we are, the more people we have in our lives. You know, alcoholics don't have a lot of people in their lives. They really don't. Uh, I remember, in my particular case, I was sitting out here in the state hospital uh, almost 25 years ago, and it wasn't no crowd there to see me, really. I never did, you know. <laughs> I, I, I was there 30 days, and I had one visitor, I believe. And, and I kid the guys over the Serenity House. I said, that's one thing we don't really have a big problem with. We don't have a sign up there that said, visiting hours from 2 to 3. We don't have a crowd trying to get in there anyway. <laughs> That's very strange. You know, you go out here to the hospital and you see people trying to get in there to see sick. Well, it's one thing about the disease of alcoholism. It's different. You know, you go, you have another day, illness, it's a heart, heart condition. You go out to the hospital, you see flowers, you see people trying to get in there and see the sick people. You know, alcoholics don't get flowers. <laughs> and they don't get, get well cards. They get a lot of get dead cards, you know. <laughs> well, what have we done with the people in our lives? You know, we really never evaluate that. You know, where are the people in our lives? You know what I mean? Where are, what have we done? And I think 8 and 9 is all about rebuilding that circle, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, to, to rebuilding our relationship with people and knowing that this is very essential. It's a, you know, we're no bigger than the people around us and the people in our lives. And uh, as we go out, our book tells us to, to set right these wrongs. If we go, as they go along each day, that we, we, we develop meaningful relationships and bring people back into our lives. It says, you know, all those these, these re repatriations taking numerous forms, there are some principles which we, which, which we find guiding. Remind ourselves we decided to go to any length to find a spiritual experience we ask that would be given strength to do the right direction and do the right thing. Throughout here we have prayer. And we, it tells about other things. It talks about, you know, um, uh, we've had, had sex outside of marriage. And these things, and, and uh, how do we handle these things, and other people involved. You know, there's a lot of different things that, uh, that go on in, uh, in making these amends. And our, books, our book deals with each and every one of these. It says, the changes we have domestic problems. Perhaps we are mixed up with women in a fashion we don't care, and I love this. We doubt if we are, are in, in, in this respect, that alcoholics are fundamentally much worse than other people. So what? We're just about like, oh, we know, we're just about like other people. But drinking does complicate sex relations in the home. Sure do. <laughs> I after, after a few years with an alcoholic, the wife becomes worn out <laughs> and resentful. Boy, he, he selected these words just right. And uncommunic. <laughs> Uncommunicative. Boy, she sure does. She communicates, but we don't like the way. How could she be anything else? He commences to look around nightclubs for are their equivalent for something besides liquor. Oh, I'm telling you. <laughs> Perhaps he is having a secret and exciting affair with a girl who understands. In fairness, we must, we must say that she may understand. I love Bill's humor. <clears throat> a man so involved often feels very remorseful at times. He does. And regardless of where we at, you know, when these things cross our mind, we're going to feel remorseful. Especially if married to a loyal and courageous girl who had literally gone through hell for him. And this is usually the case of most of the guys who come to Alcoholics Anonymous who still got their wives with them. has got, you know, we're very blessed with, with the, the people we have with us. A part of our lives when we come to Alcoholics Anonymous. You know. I, I hear... Uh, uh, as we talk about this, you know, that that uh, if they hang in here that long, you know, it's, it's really something. But what do we do about that? It says, you know, sometimes we, and it, our book doesn't give us any rules. It gives us a way to use our mind 
and, and all the time it's talking about God directing our lives. Because remember, in step three, we made a decision to turn our will and our life for care of God. So this, we have that directions in this step too. We listen for that. And we will, we will use that guidance in making these amends. If we're sure our wife know, or should, should know, should we tell her? Not always, we think. Not all the time. If she knows in a general way that we have been wild, should we tell her the details? Undoubtedly, we should admit our faults. You know I mean? She may assist her in knowing all the particulars. She will want to know who the woman is and where she is. We feel we ought to say to her that we have no right. We have no right to involve another person. You know, and that's, I think it tells us how to handle these situations. Uh, you know, like we say it. <coughs> Uh, if she's suspicion, it would be better to let her be suspicion than give her the facts, you know. Because uh, this, uh, you know, it ain't the idea we want to withhold this. Because all this may do is hurt her more. And never really improve the situation. So, you know, what we just say, we let God be, let, we, we have to use our heads and judge these situations. And sometimes he said we walk carefully through these things. But the key thing is willing. And maybe this is where the wherever possible come because... You know, as God directs our lives, as these wounds begin to heal and as time passes, it will, you know, maybe we have to live with this uh, maybe for, for six months. Maybe we have to live with this for a year until the relation and the bonds and to the thing heals. And maybe there, there will be a time, you know, of healing where these things are possible. Maybe they will be possible. But during this period of time, we would have to live with it. And if we we're willing to do it when the time comes, then we will be free. So we see there's some guidance, there's some time involved. And as we, if, uh, the key thing is to, is to pray and ask God for guidance. guidance. And then when the time comes, when the time comes, and we are to, and for us to make these amends, and it is possible, and we don't make them, then we're going to have problems. We will have problems. Sometimes if we make them too soon, we'll have problems. And if we wait too long, we're going to have problems. So we're, we're going to have some difficulties in these areas. But the key thing is to be willing to do it. And as we continue, it tells us, uh, you know, we use prayer throughout. It says each night on page 82, each night to pray about it, having, having no, have the other one's happiness in mind. On page 83 of our book, it says, so clean house with the family each morning in meditation. Um, that our creator show us a way of patience, tolerance, kindness, and love. See, that's prayer in every step after step three. You know, this is not a do-it-yourself program. And surely we need God's directions and guidance in taking a step like, taking some steps like eight and nine. Because each one of them take directions. Each one of them take great insight. And surely we as people, surely we are no expert on human nature with the mess we've made in, li in our lives. <coughs> And if we don't have some, if we haven't developed our spiritual lives, we're going to make a mess. And we don't really go out here on our own and do step 89. Because we do, we'll make, we'll make a greater mess than we had before. But as we begin to, to go through this list and, 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 and meet these things, uh, we'll find that our relationship with people will grow. We'll clear up the relationships of the past. And, and I think that you know, as, as life's going, we see people come back into our lives. And surely in my life, I think about, you know, I think one of the most valuable things that I thank God every day, not for Alcoholics Anonymous. And I thank God for, for the people in my life. You know, all the people in my life. You know, when I think back about 25 years ago, that in 30 days, no one thought enough to come to see me. You know what I mean? Hell, that's just the way I was. But through the, through, the, through the program and through the growth, and, and, uh, and people have come back into my life, and that's one of the most valuable things in my life is people. Yeah. But once we get that done, we have come to the promises of the big book, and I love the promises. The promises come as a result of the steps. You know, the promises are not just, you know, promises mean uh, work. You know, when I was a kid, I used to get up every morning and in my days, in my time, most of you kids, most of the young people wouldn't remember that, don't know anything about that, but in my time of growing up, the whole experience of the week was going to the movies. See, we didn't have TV. You can't imagine that. I know you said, but we didn't have TV. You know what I mean? 
all you, all you did is, you know, you, uh, you got to go to the movie on Saturday. And if you didn't go to the movie on Saturday, when I was a kid, you, 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 you wasn't hitting on nothing. You didn't know nothing unless you went to the movie. <laughs> See, we got, we got two movies, we got the cowboy picture, this gangster picture, and, and the cereal, and uh, all that for 15 cents, you know. And if you were lucky enough to get a quarter, man, you could get a bag of popcorn for a nickel, and a whole bunch of candy for another nickel, and you was in heaven for about two hours, on three or four hours on Saturday. So every Saturday morning I'd get up, my mother would always make promises. She said, Joe, I'm going to let you go to the picture show this evening. After, and she had a bunch of steps for me to take before. <laughs> I think she had more than 12, you know. <laughs> you're going to whitewash the fence back in those days, boy. I mean, you're going to cut the grass, and you're going to do this, and you're going to do this, and you're going to do And then I'm going to let you go to the picture show. Promises always come as a result of some action. Now, after nine simple steps, we got this thing in some resemblance of where the promises are going to be met. We got a long ways to go. No, we're not perfect. But we got our lives in order already where we, all, you know, we, we, we don't need to drink alcohol. After nine steps. You know, you don't have to be, so he, he said in a few months you can do this. A few months, our book said this personality change can take place as a result of these steps. You don't have to be very well not to drink. In fact, you've got to be pretty sick to take the drink. You know what I mean? you got to be pretty sick to take something that's killing you. That's insanity. So in these few steps, we got things in order. Now it says, you know, we have been painstaking with this phase of our development before we are halfway through. Now, we, we're not through. We're just about halfway through. We're going to have some other steps. We're going to have a steps 10, 11, and 12 that deal with this other dimension. And this is unlimited. There's no circle around that. You know, we can grow and grow for the rest of our lives. And that's what we're going to go into next week. But here, at these, after nine steps, we have the promises. If we have been painstaking with this phase of our development already, it says we know a new freedom and a new happiness. You know I'm spiritually well, I'm mentally well, and I can look people in the eye. We will not regret the, past, regret the past, I went to shut the door on it. We will comprehend the word serenity and we will know peace. No matter how far down the scale we have gone, we will see that our experience can benefit others. That feeling of usefulness and self-pity will disappear. We will lose interest in selfish things and gain interest in our fellows. Self-seeking will slip away. Our whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. Fear of people and economic insecurity will leave us. We will intuitively know how the hound situation which used to baffle us. We will suddenly realize that God is doing for us and we not do for ourselves. Are these exaggerated promises? We think not. They are being fulfilled among us. Sometimes quickly in the spiritual experience, that's real quick, Sometimes slowly, and that's in the spiritual awakening that takes place over months. They will always materialize if we work for them. Now, you know, uh, for many years, you know, we drank alcohol. As I said earlier, I had problems in my life, and I, all my life I've hunted for a sense of ease and comfort. I don't know why. All my life. You know, when I, I all my life as a kid, I, I remember pursuing, I, I, just, I, I just couldn't wait till Christmas, I'll be happy. It was 4th of July, but I'd be happy Christmas, you know. When Christmas come, oh, it wasn't that much. <laughs> Maybe and then after Christmas was over, I said, boy, I'll be happy when we have the picnic 4th of July. <laughs> I mean, but just for a moment, you know, just for a moment. Maybe that's what life is all, maybe that's the pursuit of it, you know. But all my life, I searched for a sense of ease and comfort. Somewhere along the line, you know, I found alcohol. And I remember my first drinks. I remember my first experience with alcohol. And when I found alcohol, I, for the first time in my life, I found that sense of ease and comfort. It came to once of taking a few drinks of alcohol. God, man, where does this stuff be? And, I, and then my book said that I pursued that great illusion. I chased that 
great illusion of release. The gates and sanity of death. Alcohol, instead of being my friend, they turned it on me and become my greatest enemy. So I had to take that out. And, I, I, and, and then there I was, right back in the same place. Back to self. So the program said, take out self and put God back in. And then go back to work on yourself. And then clear your relationship with other people. Now here after working these steps, I found out I, I have this, uh, this uh, sense of ease and comfort that I always pursued in alcohol. You know, it talks about, right, I, I know serenity, I know peace, I know a new freedom. And, and I get, get this out of alcohol and I don't have to take a drink and I don't have to go to jail anymore and I don't have to lose my job. And boy, this is, this is great, man. This is great. And you don't have to go down to the store and get a little half pint bottle and the man don't look at you funny, you know. <laughs> and I'll tell you, this is, this is what this program is all about. Now, you know, we can, I, I would love to read these and we read them over again and tell what I was really doing in the early days. And this is when I took a drink when I was young and drank alcohol made me feel good and did everything for me and didn't do anything bad to me in the early days. I ain't talking about the last drink. I'm talking about many years ago. Many years ago in the first early years of my drinking, when I took a drink, I knew a new freedom and a new happiness. When I took a drink, I did not regret the past. I wished to shut the door on it. When I took a drink of alcohol, I could comprehend the word serenity, and I knew peace. When I took a drink, no matter how far the scale down the scale I had gone, I could see my, how my experience could benefit others. Boy, I could see myself on a bar stool now. <laughs> when I took a drink, the feeling of uselessness and self-pity would disappear. When I took a drink, I would lose interest in selfish things and gain interest in my fellows. When I took a drink, self-seeking would slip away. When I took a drink of alcohol, my whole attitude and outlook upon life would change. When I took a drink of alcohol, fear of people and economic insecurity would leave me. That's where all my money went away. <laughs> Got spent every bit of it. You know, you need a little economic insecurity. When I took a drink, I would intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle me. When I took a drink, I would suddenly realize that alcohol was doing for me what I could not do for myself. And this is what, so this is a miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, that we have taken out, we just can't take out alcohol. You know, you can't take out alcohol. And for many years, we try to quit drinking. But through these first nine steps, we have a personality change already sufficient to recover from alcoholism. You know, it's not, you know, we say in AA, you know, it, through, as results of the AA program, you know, not just going to the meetings, but as a result of the AA program, I have had a, a personality change. I've had a spiritual experience which produced a change in my life. And it isn't necessary for me to drink anymore already after step nine. Now, of course, if we had these things, you know, we were, this is a great place to be for the first time as we experience these things. And I remember, it wasn't a bang, but I remember over a period of short time after working the steps, over a period of weeks right on, I would experience a few of these things in my life. And I was able to comprehend the word serenity. The first time I really, you know, before when I went to the meeting, serenity was something they talked about. I didn't know much about it. Serenity is something you have to experience. No one can explain to you what it is. You know, if we could explain to an alcoholic what serenity was, we'd have a line from here to the freeway. You know, it's something you have to experience. And as a result of these steps, we'll begin to experience these things. You know, it's, it's great. And you know, it would be good, and we, we go into this new life, and it's hard for us, we can't become complacent and stop here. And it's better than anything we've ever had, but there's a lot more to this. You know, the program says we must grow, must continue to grow. So the next three steps talk, uh, are going to be a program of, once we complete these nine steps, then we have a program of continuous growth. Uh, and we'll begin next week with step 10, which is going to show us how to how to have a daily program of growth. Uh, we're not, not maintain because we can't maintain the human life. It's a very complicated thing. We're either going to get better or get worse. So the name of the game is continuous growth and we'll begin next week in step 10. And we'll work through these steps and to see how we continue to grow in the fourth dimension.